too. Thank you. Um, so I'm the last speaker standing be between you and lunch. Um, hopefully this will be, you know, uh, an interactive session as well uh, because we have a really small crowd over here. Um, anything I would like to say, you know, is not uh, gospel or doctrine. Uh, I think I'm open for discussion and I'd love to hear from the ground as well in terms of, uh, you know, what do you all think with regards to what I'm going to talk about today, which is the developer-first culture. So maybe before I begin, uh, since I've already sort of like introduced myself, I'd like to know a little bit about uh, you guys. Um, how many of you are engineers or developers? Okay, that's quite a handful. How many of you are team leads and managers? How many of you are C-level executives? Nice. All right. So I hope that this talk, you know, will speak to all levels uh, and you'll be able to take away um, things uh, from this talk and be able to implement some of these things back in your, in your company. So I'm Winston Teo. Uh, this is my Twitter handle. And um, yeah, the, the bio has already talked about, you know, what I was doing before, etc. Um, I thought what would be interesting is to share my GitHub profile. Uh, my, my GitHub profile is actually github.com slash Winston. So as you know, with all um, services nowadays, it's very difficult to actually you know, get your first name or last name um, <laughs> on the service itself. So I actually got this because I joined github.com um, on March 4, 2008. I think that was when github.com was still in beta and they only actually launched in April 2008, which is why I was lucky enough to get Winston. Uh, all my other you know, handles end with Winston YW because you'll never be able to get Winston. So I was thinking whether I should change my GitHub to Winston YW, but I'm like, uh, I think this is, this is a nice one, so I probably shouldn't mess around with it. So uh, right now, I'm actually with SP Group, uh, formerly known as Singapore Power. So we actually did a rebranding exercise last year. So if you're unfamiliar with SP Group, you'll be probably more familiar with Singapore Power. Yes, we are the company that sends you the utilities bill uh, every month, um, amongst other things. Right? Uh, and I actually work in this team uh, called SP Digital uh, within SP Group. So we are a new team that was set up around um, 20 months ago uh, to drive digitalization within SP. So as what you might have noticed is that uh, nowadays innovation is key. So a lot of companies are embarking on their digital transformation journey where uh, companies try to outsource much lesser and try to bring you know, talent in-house just like what GovTech is doing so that developers are actually part of the company uh, to help drive innovation, help drive digital change and prep the company for future where digital is key. Right? So that is uh, you know, what SP Digital, the team, is all about. And when we started from 20 months ago, uh, you know, there was only one person, which is my boss, Sao Xiong, uh, and we sort of grew the team to around 80 to 90 people today. Um, so that's how fast and how rapid we grew. So within SP Digital, I'm actually in charge of uh, engineering excellence team. So you might not find this you know, term familiar because it's not common in companies to actually have this team. Um, what we actually look at is a lot about culture, a lot about development practices, a lot about engineering effectiveness. And I just found out that actually Twitter in US actually has a big team you know, dedicated to engineering effectiveness alone to make other engineers more effective, right? And also we, just, we look at technical excellence. How can we write better code? How can we write high quality code? Because to us, all of these things are important, right? It's no longer just about shipping products, but how do we make the products that we ship, you know, good, high quality, reliable, stable, etc. So today, um, so that's a little bit about me and what, I've been, what I'm working on in SP Group, SP Digital. Uh, today I'm going to talk about developer-first culture. So when you hear this term, developer-first culture, you know, what, what comes to mind? What do you think about? Anyone? People? Great. Developer happiness? Love it. Nice coffee machine. <laughs> Do we have that? We don't have that. <laughs> That's true as well. You know, uh, Google will say, you know, pantry, there's not, there's like, what, within five meters or something <laughs> to, to every cubicle, right? So I, I think she got the answer, right? It's about optimizing for developer happiness uh, when we talk about developer first culture. 
So some of you might be thinking, why is this important? Why are we optimizing for developer happiness? Why are these bunch of people so special, you know? Why do I optimize for accounting happiness, financial people happiness, procurement happiness? Why do I want to just optimize for developer happiness? So I think there are two key points that I want to bring across uh, on why we want to, uh, you know, uh, De optimize for developer happiness. As I've mentioned earlier, a lot of companies right now are going through digital transformation, going through digital change. So a lot of it is based off building your own internal product uh, and less so much of outsourcing. You need to have the in-house knowledge retained within the company so as to be able to continue to innovate uh, and develop new things to push the company forward. So once you start to you know, understand that, you start to know that developers are the ones who will help you achieve that vision or mission that you set out with. And if you do understand that, then you'll know that it's difficult to hire, and it's even more difficult you know, to retrain people once they leave the company. So by optimizing for developer happiness, we can actually help to hire you know, great developers and also help to keep great developers within the company. As you would see you know, with a lot of big companies that have been doing that, Google, Facebook, Twitter, right? So this is something uh, that, I, that we have seen you know, happening within our team as well, right? Uh, where we try our best to optimize for developer happiness and to make sure that we do listen to feedback, criticisms, and work on them so that people feel purposeful and meaningful in doing their work. And of course, happy developers produce quality work. Um, and it's not just actually developers, right? Happy people in general produce high quality work because you feel that you know, you're not being forced to do something uh, and you go all out to actually figure out you know, how to do something well, how to do something proper. Uh, and that's where the intrinsic value comes in, the motivation for you to actually excel in your work. And so it is important for us to keep our people happy so that they will continue to produce good work. So what would when we talk about happiness, you know, what do we actually mean? Uh, so there, there's a lot of definitions of happiness if you go around, right? Uh, delivering happiness from Zappos. They talk about the three Ps, uh, passion, profit, and purpose, right? Uh, Dan Pink, in his book, Drive, he talks about purpose, autonomy, and mastery. Um, so that's sort of, you know, uh, but in, in essence, you know, they all follow like the same uh, trend, right? There's purpose, you know, uh, there's passion, uh, and sometimes there's money involved, <laughs> right? Uh, but in general, uh, I think I subscribe to this um, definition by ten, Dan Pink more, where it's about, really about purpose, about having the autonomy um, to do things uh, within the scope of boundaries, reasonable, um, and of course having the mastery uh, within your skills, uh, within your depth of expertise. So, what can we do, you know, as a company, as a team, to help develop uh, and optimize for developer happiness in terms of any of these three? I think for purpose, right, uh, it, it all comes up to the very top management level. What is your vision? What is your mission? That sort of like helps to set the purpose of the team, of the company. So I'm not going to go into that, right? Uh, it might not be easy for us to actually change anything at that level. Uh, autonomy is also about you know, how teams are being managed, how your bosses actually look after you and how they actually want to run the team. Uh, as you have, if you have read around, you know, there are always a lot of articles about you know, why do people want to leave the company. It's usually not about the work, but it's about the bosses. <laughs> you know? So as a boss, you probably want to give you know, more autonomy to the people uh, that, that are under you. And so I want to focus a little bit more about mastery because that's where I feel, you know, every one of us can play a part in helping each other level up in terms of, of their skills uh, to achieve mastery and thereby, you know, being a recipe to how we can achieve uh, developer happiness. When we talk about mastery in terms of software creation, software development, what do we actually mean? So to me, I, I would feel that I would like to term it another way. I like to call it software craftsmanship. It's about understanding that software, right? The creation of software, the building of software, development of software is no longer just you know, an engineering work where you get, a, you get a, a, a full stack of docs, specifications, and just working through it you know, in some cave or some mountain up there and come back six months later with the fully developed product. Um, software creation is really 
a blend of art, a blend of science, and a blend of engineering right now. Uh, and it's as much as possible, it embodies the value of the person who's actually writing the code. It's sort of like a personal statement of how you want the product to look like, how you want the product to be. Um, so by understanding that, I feel that this is really what software craftsmanship is about and how we should actually be uh, you know, driving software craftsmanship within our company, within our team. So if you do search around you know, for software craftsmanship, actually this will come up as well. It's a manifesto for software craftsmanship. Uh, some of you might have heard of the manifesto for agile, right? Um, you know, people over uh, processors, etc. So this is sort of like building on top of uh, the manifesto for Agile, and this is the manifesto for software craftsmanship. So it's not only about working software, but also well-crafted software. It's not only about responding to change, but also about steadily adding value. It's not only about individuals and interactions, but also about a community of professionals. And it's not only about customer collaboration, but also productive partnerships. And of course, in this website, if you scroll down, there's a lot of luminaries who actually signed off you know, on this manifesto. Uh, it's, not, it's not very well known, but if you do search around for it, you'll be able to find it. So I'm going to focus a little bit now about you know, how then uh, SP Digital, uh, we do our work in order to achieve uh, developer happiness. I'm not going to say that we are getting everything right. I think this, is, this team is just a 20 months old team. So a lot of things are still work in progress. Uh, we're still trying to improve ourselves, uh, to better ourselves, to actually make our developers even happier. Right? Uh, but this is some of the things that we can share uh, that we feel have helped, uh, or at least I feel have helped contribute to <laughs> developer happiness. My developers will tell me whether it's right or wrong. <laughs> So when I talk about developer happiness, right, I think I, I sort of like broke it down into a few things that we can look at uh, in terms of things that are within our control that we can try and fix uh, and get it right so that uh, developers will find it easier and more productive to work in, in this specific uh, environment. So these are the four areas uh, that I'll be talking about. Development practices, tech stack, tools, and environment. So when we talk about development practices, uh, I think it's important for us to establish you know, the working model, the workflow of day-to-day -day interaction, day-to-day -day collaboration, uh, so that, uh, like I mentioned, software creation is not you know, one person, uh, it's a team's effort. Um, and I think it's important for us to work out you know, how people work with one another. Uh, if I have to term it, I would term you know, our working model, working workflow as agile. But at the same time, uh, I'm really trying to move away from this word Agile um, and just call it our working model, right? Uh, I think it's a blend uh, of Agile and many other pragmatic means of making things work in general. Uh, the core essence of it, to me, is having constant feedback uh, between every party within the team. These are just some of the things in terms of the developer practices that we do to ensure that continuous feedback happens uh, between your code between the developer, between developers, between developer and product people, uh, and other higher management. So we definitely do daily stand-up. Um, I'm not dogmatic about it, like having it to be face-to-face. -face. Some, some of my teams have already crossed that hurdle and started to do it remotely online, a virtual. Uh, so we use Slack, so they actually have a schedule, you know, how they that actually prompts, you know, what are you working on today? What, problems you have, etc. There are some teams that still do face-to-face, -face, and I still think there's merits in doing face-to-face, -face, uh, but it really depends you know, on your team uh, and the makeup of the team. Uh, some people are just more introverted than others. Some people you know, have different working timings, etc. So it's about keeping that flexibility. Um, we definitely do code review or even pair programming. Um, so this is where I feel uh, it's important in helping us achieve mastery and thereby developer happiness, right? Um, by having your code reviewed, you'll know that you're working in a team and you're not working in silo. You'll be able to learn from people who are more senior than you or even people who are more junior than you, right? Uh, I think 
when we are building software, it's always an ever-learning journey. Um, I don't feel that a senior can't learn from a junior. You'll probably be you know, plateauing somewhere that you will still need sometimes juniors, you know, uh, motivation or inspiration to help you cross that hurdle and learn something new, even within you know, the, the scope of the skill sets that you're talking about. And we also definitely do pair programming, not on a day-to-day -day basis, but on a need-to basis. Uh, so later on, I'll have some pictures to show you actually, you know, our pair programming stations that have been set up to help optimize, you know, for pair programming work to actually happen. So pair programming is really about two developers sitting side by side each other and working on the same piece of code together. It might sound unintuitive, uh, but it works, right? Just imagine your day-to-day -day work. Uh, when you go into office, what do you do the first thing? Probably check your emails. If the internet doesn't block Facebook, you'll probably go to Facebook. If the internet doesn't block YouTube, you'll probably open up YouTube, right? Uh, and sometimes you might be distracted here and there, you'll be lost in your train of thoughts. Some people might come and ping you, you'll lose your contacts, etc. So there's a lot of context switching around. When you're doing pair programming, you're really sitting side by side another fellow developer. You're concentrating on the same piece of code together. It's continuous, instantaneous code review, right? And that's where your time is maximized. I've done it for three years straight uh, when I was in Pivotal Labs. And if you ask me, I still love to do pair programming. Of course, I'm now more of an engineering manager, so I do a little bit, I do less of that or not much of that <laughs> anymore. But I hope to get back into that. But if you ask me, right, um, I think once you, once you start to build you know, that um, rhythm, uh, you find that it's really effective, it's very useful. You just have to come in, pair, go off, and you know that your code is working because someone has looked at it together with you in, in the same day. Uh, so that's pair programming. Testing. Um, I would love to put here test-driven development, but I must be honest, I think uh, the team grew very rapidly from a team of 1 to 80. Uh, as much as I do test-driven development, I don't think that you know, um, model has been passed down to everyone, but I think what is still important for us is that we still do testing, and I still do want to you know, pitch the concept of TDD uh, to my whole team uh, in the years to come. Um, but so this is important to us because it makes sure that you know, code is reliable, code is stable, uh, and we are not just, you know... So when we do interviews, right, a lot of times I hear people say, oh, do you write code, uh, do you write tests in, in your work, current work? People will say, no. Then I'll be asked, oh, why not? Or uh, deadlines, right? Uh, my boss say I need to rush for a deadline. So uh, that is the you know, top number one uh, answer that I usually get. So over here, what we do is to say, we value your craft, right? We believe that writing test is important to make sure that your code uh, is working well and the product is of the highest quality possible. So please allocate time to write tests. And we do always go to developers to tell them, hey, have you written your test? Right? And of course, uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery. I think it's very important to us to see code going out to production so that we can actually verify that, hey, things are working. And the manner of it going to production is fast, is rapid, so that we can get feedback uh, very quickly. These are just some pictures of our daily stand-up. Um, like I said, so this was taken very early in the days. Um, and there are two teams doing daily stand-up over here. Um, and some of them are doing virtual stand-ups now. Uh, we have pair programming stations that have been set up in some corners of the office. Um, it used to be where people would go to one another's tables and just pair over there, but we found that uh, it might not be the most optimal. Uh, why not we build you know, a few pair programming stations that's really for the purpose of doing that. And people have given us a lot of feedback to say, hey, it really helps, you know, just going to there, the keyboards are there, the mouse are there, everything is set up, two monitors, etc. So there's no hassle of trying to oh, figure out which keyboard to use, which mouse to use, uh, not enough monitors, etc. Huddling at you know, one single spot. So these are just some of the things that we do. Um, so those are more of the you know, daily workflow development practices. Uh, we also have code practices uh, where we try and maintain you know, sanity of the code, readability of the code, and of course, hoping that people uh, will hold themselves up to the highest uh, you know, bar in terms of what high-quality code or good code means. So we do have programming language style guides that we adopt, for example, like Go, like Ruby, etc. We put in automated linters to make sure that you know, we resolve the problems of spaces versus tabs, uh, trailing empty lines, trailing spaces, etc. Uh, you know, variable names, 
so on and so forth. Um, as much as possible, I try and advocate you know, for developers to imagine, even though you know, we are building enterprise software and our code is hosted in GitHub Enterprise on our own premise, to imagine that whatever they are doing is open source. Why? So that documentation is in place. When they do GitHub pull requests, things are proper. They give good descriptions uh, on what the GitHub pull request is all about so that other people can really come in and help to do code review properly. Um, there's many other practices you, know, you can adopt from the open source world. Uh, I have been participating in the open source world for quite a while and so some of these things I bring back to me because I feel that by writing your code in that manner, it really helps in collaboration, communication and also quality. And of course, you know, the emphasis on readability of the code so that uh, further down the line, new joiners can actually be able to maintain the code very easily. Okay, I'm running short of time, I think. Uh, tech stack. Um, so by clearing, you know, getting this out of the way, uh, we sort of like reduce the debate of, oh, hey, there's a new project. Let's try and use, you know, new programming language A or new programming language B. So at least, you know, our main language stack, we have established it to be like, Let's use Golang for backend services, microservices. Let's use Ruby, Ruby on Rails for front-end code, uh, Swift for iOS, uh, Java for Android. There might be you know, a shift. I know a lot of companies are going to Kotlin for Android. We might be looking at that, but again, then it's still up in the works. But at least at the very top, you know, this is what we have established. So we don't go beyond that. Um, tools. Uh, these are just some of the tools that we are using, right? It's not exhaustive. Uh, and there's many different tools that we use as well. But I just want to point out that, you know, it's very important uh, to pick the right tools for the right thing. Um, and to, if money is not a problem, use money to buy the best tool that you can so that your developers can work uh, in the most optimized and productive manner as possible. Before we even embark on all these tools, right? I think there was one thing that we need to resolve when the team started at the very beginning, which was, where do we store our source code? Right? That was central or core to us in terms of all these other tools that we have. Because we need to decide, where do we want to put our source code with? Uh, what, is co what, what, what is clear to us is we definitely want to use Git. Right? Uh, but we can use Git with many different platforms, or we can self-host, or we can do many other things with Git alone. Uh, but we decided that we wanted something that's familiar with the people that we're hiring. Uh, we wanted something that, you know, would interest the people that we're hiring. So it was the crowd that we we're trying to attract to uh, and pitch to. And so we went with GitHub. Uh, and of course, because we have to host it uh, on premise, it's GitHub Enterprise. Uh, and it worked out really well for us. Not only is it used for source code, as a source code repository. Uh, we also use it for a lot of general documentation that's non-code specific. We have one repo called spdocs, which has everything inside uh, for people to refer to, you know, in terms when they join, you know, our team to understand more about how the team is like, how the company is like, etc. administration staff, so on and so forth, right? Uh, some of the teams use it for project planning uh, because of the new project planning features that GitHub uh, has and like for example, I use it for team discussions where I just create you know issues uh, in one non-code repo and start to get my team in to discuss about how we want to do things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so it's become you know like a, a Swiss Army knife for us, and it works really well. But of course, you know, central to what GitHub is about is that as a GitHub, uh, it's a code repo. You know, this is how you know roughly we use it in terms of our deployment, in terms of uh, our daily uh, workflow. So definitely code will be checking into GitHub. Uh, Jenkins will be our build tool. There's a lot of pools for changes. It will run tests. It will do a deployment out. Uh, and we would have configured it to deploy to you know, feature branches, QA branches, staging, or even production. But what, what's interesting you know, is that GitHub also has a lot of uh, integrations that other developers have built for. So for example, this code analysis tools that I, I, I put over here. Uh, the two uh, logos represent code climate and danger dot system. I'm going to show you a little bit example of what I mean when these things are being integrated with GitHub. So I hope this is big enough, but you can see this is like 
a typical pull request that we have. I've masked out uh, important information, but the gist of it is that someone made a pull request, and what happened was that uh, danger.system on Jenkins actually kicked in uh, and ran something off the code that was uh, pushed to GitHub as a pull request. So what happened is that you know, it ran code coverage, uh, it ran these other two called Rubicorp to see you know, if there are any code violations, and it actually commented back into the pull request itself to tell us you know, how is this piece of code doing. Uh, is it good or is it bad? Is there anything that we should need to fix? Right? So this is one part of how we integrated other services into the GitHub workflow. Next, um, pull request approval. So we are enterprise, right? So this is central <laughs> to us. We are not startup where you know, some other developer can just uh, pull requests and, and merge in. We need this approval process. So this is already built into GitHub. So it's very good for us where we can actually assign approvals. Uh, and these approvals can come in and give you know, the green mark on, OK, this is good. It's good to go, etc. So you can actually assign multiple approvals. We can approve, and then you can merge. Um, and here, status checks. Uh, I think it's extension of the status checks API, uh, where we have it integrated with Code Climate, Danger Dot System, Jenkins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what you can see here is that uh, we actually have Code Climate, which is a static code analysis tool, running uh, on this branch uh, on this PR to tell us, you know, how is it doing? Are there any other further code violations other than the Rubicorp one that was found earlier? Um, did it actually regress the quality of the code? So that is central to code climate. But what's useful here is that the status are actually pumped back in. So I can, with at one glance, see you know, whether code climate uh, is saying you know, there are things working or things not working. You can actually see here we fixed 51 issues that code climate actually raised. Uh, and continuous integration, so that is, of course, the test being run uh, by Jenkins and the status coming back to tell us this branch is great, this branch is good, so let, let's do it. Uh, danger as well, you know, on, on the comments earlier. So last bit, uh, which is about environment. Right? So I spoke about uh, development practices, tech stack, tools, right? and about environment. So this is the last bit which uh, we, uh, as SB Digital, has been trying to do uh, to make it you know, a more welcoming place for people uh, to come and work with, uh, together with us. So we believe that you know, SP Digital is a formation of a community of communities. Uh, actually, there's a lot of community influencers within uh, this SP Digital team. I used to run the Ruby meetup. We have uh, you know, Soup, who is running the iOS meetups, iOS conf. Uh, we have you know, people who are running the hackware meetup. We have Michael over there, who is running engineers.sg. Um, it's really a, a culmination of all these people from who are you know, strong community believers coming together to, to work together. So what we do is to continue to embrace that concept and continue to pitch that forward to our new joiners, new hires, even people who, are, who haven't been in the community before because this is what we believe in. This is how, how it helps to build your mastery within, this, uh, within your, your scope uh, area of focus. So uh, we also do internal tech talks. Every Thursday, without fail, you know, someone would be raising his hands to say, hey, I want to talk about something, be it you know, specific to uh, his part of the project or be it something on the side that he has been doing. So we do this on every Thursday during lunchtime. Uh, we have tech sharing uh, across teams as well, uh, where you know, we have Go share, we have Ruby share, we have mobile share, where people will share you know, things that they are doing differently in different projects uh, within one meeting session uh, so that people can cross learn from each other. Uh, we are also a huge you know, uh, advocate for meetups and conferences. Uh, I think within our, I think we have hosted like 20 plus meetups in the last year uh, within our office itself uh, iOS meetups, Ruby meetups, women who code. Uh, UX meetups, etc., etc., uh, and by hosting them, we also encourage our own people to join in and participate. Uh, we also, you know, actively give back to conferences and actually help conferences. So, uh, these are some pictures of, of meetups that we have hosted uh, earlier this year, and these are the four big conferences that we have actually contributed to, you know, as as active uh, participants or as active organizers. Uh, 
last year. So the first one is GopherConf SG, uh, because we are using Go. Um, second one was Red Dot RubyConf. Third one was uh, iOS Conf, and last one was GitCamp SG. Each of these conf, you know, average I think was around 250 to 300 uh, attendees in general. So this is like sort of you know the the environment uh, and culture that we're trying to pitch uh, to our own fellow developers, uh, to our team, to say, hey, you know, please participate actively in all of this because. Uh, by collaboration, you know, by knowing more people, by doing these community efforts, we think that it would help you become a better developer and a happier developer. Uh, otherwise, it definitely helps learning, right? Because you go to all these conferences, you go to all these meetups, you go to these tech talks, what is it intended to do? It's to allow you to learn. Learn a lot more about your craft. Learn a lot more about your skills, your expertise. Right? And thereby growing, you know, growing as a software engineer, growing as a software developer. Uh, and of course, then with that, you know, uh, we hope that these you know, four items would help build, uh, develop, optimize for developer happiness. At least you know, that's true for us over in SP Digital. Uh, and by doing all of these things, you, know, you probably get mastery, uh, which then, like I mentioned, is a recipe for developer happiness. Thank you. Sorry. Any questions or I'm out of time? Yes. I think uh, the growth has definitely been a biggest challenge. Uh, like I mentioned, the team is still very young. 20 months old, but we grew from 1 to 80 to 90 people. So uh, my team, the engineering excellence team, which is you know, sort of like looking after this, is still a relatively small team. Um, and then, like I said, so it's difficult to actually spread practices around, right? As much as possible, I would like to do TDD with everyone, but my, I can't scale myself as fast enough. So that has been the major challenge. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yes. Do you mean github.com versus github enterprise or yeah, uh, other tools? Okay. I think at that time, we didn't really see Visual Studio online. I mean, we explored other tools like, can I say them, like GitLab <laughs> and other tools, <laughs> right? Um, we did explore some of these, these other tools. Um, but we sort of went back to GitHub uh, because, like I mentioned, uh, the profile of developers that we are hiring, a lot of them have active open source contributions background. They're very familiar with GitHub and how it works. The UX, the UI, and of course, you know, uh, not, I mean, it's not just because I'm here at GitHub, you know, event I'm talking about them, but I think we believe in, you know, the developments that GitHub will be putting forth in terms of how the product will be growing. Uh, and that's why we thought that this, it should be, you know, a good investment for us to actually go with GitHub uh, versus some of the other tools out there. Uh, and so far, we have, you know, uh, we think that the decision is good. Yep. Sorry. We're going to have to move on for lunch, but Winston's going to be here and he can continue to answer questions. Thank you.